Uh, this is in my face. Uh, that's fine. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, this is my honor to speak today. I have an accent, so stop me if I speak, get agitated, get angry, I want to speak everything, stop me. I have an accent. I speak three languages, so English is my third language, not the second even. So uh, this, is, uh, this is my humbling honor to speak to you today. Uh, this is actually 78 uh, lecture across the United States. I spoke in 22 uh, Quaker groups across the United States. They have sometimes silent meetings. I live, you know, in the Quaker meetings. So, uh, and uh, I worked also with the Friends uh, Committee in, in Gaza. With Mike, Mike is uh, in Philadelphia, the headquarters, so I was working with them in uh, different projects. Uh, and we are in touch with them with some proposals for uh, Gaza population. So today I will give you the roadmap of what I'm going to speak. And uh, I, I can give you the choice. If you want me to speak about Gaza per se, I would love to do that. If you want me to speak about refugees overseas and here, or you want to combine both, it's up to you. You are the star, the star of the show, not me. But, so I will try, uh, so I will take 45 minutes then, if I want to talk about this. Uh, so again, thank you so uh, uh, for inviting me. Thank you, thank you all for coming. That's mean that you want to hear the truth and I will be as uh, objective and as honest as I can based on facts about uh, my talk, as much as I can. And you can stop me, I am not like uh, a TED talk. It's not a TED talk, we conversation. Uh, so can, can you go to the next one? So, uh, you, as you know, Palestine, Palestine, since 1970, there was a Pilford Declaration. It was by the British Empire in that time. And they offered Israel a, a, a promise that we will give you a land. We'll give you a land. It was mandated Palestine un, under, under the British colonization. As you know, <laughs> the Brits <laughs> were colonizing everywhere. So, so 19, from 1906, we have 3% of Jews. And when I talk about Jews, I have a lot of Jewish friends. I'm talking about Zionism and the coming of Haganah gangs and coming of uh, the advent of Haganah gangs and Argon gangs who came to Palestine to sequat, kill people, and think they, there, were, there were no Palestinians. And I think if in the US history also, you can remember when they came and they said there, there was no people like in the United States. So it is a great manifest destiny ideology. I think it is equals to Zionism. Zionism is a political secular movement that started in the 18th uh, century and started with the cultural Zionism and then political Zionism until now it is geni genocidal Zionism. They kill people, they burn them alive. And this is, this is psycho, psychopathology for me, especially I'm talking about psychology. This is psychopathology. You burn people alive, you murder them in front of their kids, and you are happy about that. This is sociopath and psychopath. Let me go here. So here in 1947, look at Palestine. It was 50-50, the United Nation in 1947. I don't want to mention in May or the, the month. Did partition plan. The partition plan was non-abiding by the international law, non-abiding. So they gave us a 53% for the colonizers, for the newcomers. Imagine if I come to your country, I am Palestinian, I will take, they will give me like 53% and you have nothing. So if, I know you can relate to this in the US history, but you can see, see it here. So 1947, the partition plan it was given to Israel to secure, and to be honest with you, to secure uh, the Jewish uh, persecuted Jews in over, all over the world. It was real, and it was honest, and they said, you know, we have to have a place for them in Palestine. We have to have a place for them because they are like in Eastern Europe, in Poland, they were suffering, and there was, there was history of persecu persecution for 1,500 against the Jewish community in Eastern Europe. This is a history, we can't deny it. So they said, you know, look, let's, let's have a place to them. 
So that place will be Palestine. In 1897, 222 Jewish rabbis were meeting in Basel, Switzerland. They were looking for a place to stay, and this is documented by their own resources. Argentina, Vermont, Texas, so they can come. But Eisenhower in that time said, no, this is a history. So, but they came to our country, not as a refugee, not as uh, people who want to sit with us. They came with Argon gangs to kill, to kill the indigenous people. They thought that it's a holy land, Jews, Muslim, and Christian, but turned out they actually, they have no clue about Judaism. So this is 1947, as you can see, in 90, and this is the UN plan. You can see how Palestine, the, red, the white one, now is Israel. Look, about 1946, Israel in 1967, they took 22% that we have, they took, occupied all of Palestine. Before that, in 1948, we have, we have 28%, 20, 22% of Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And this is why I want to mention about the two-state solution that is a big lie because people don't criticize their own thinking. So, so 22%, uh, if you can see, 22%. In 1967, Israel occupied all of Palestine. Occupied all of Palestine. All of it, Gaza Strip, West Bank. That's why you hear in the news 50 years of occupation. No, it is 70 years of occupation since 1948. This is a real mistake in the US media, and actually it is intentional. The occupation started from 1947. And 1948, they killed thousands of people. They expelled more than 850,000, 850,000 population out of Palestine. So uh, that's why we have 15 million refugees across the globe. And they, they destroyed, completely destroyed 532 villages, completely. And these are also, if you can read Elan Babe, he is Israeli historian. He wrote the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. There are different books uh, about like good numbers with that, but all of them talk about more than 532 uh, villages that were destroyed. So look about Palestine right now. We have now just 7% of Palestine. That's why 7% and within the 7%, can you go to the other shot, uh, slide? No, oh yeah, uh, no, the other one. So if you look, so we are, right now, we have 7%. And you'll look it up. Every word you can look it up. I have business cards. Every word I speak, debunk any facts that I'm telling you. These are facts. This is, I, there is no time for disagreements, actually, about it. Because it's facts by the international, by United Nations, by UNICEF, by UNDB, by all of the international organizations. They are objective and by American delegation like Flint's committee. They were there and they were writing. So look at Gaza. Gaza's right now is I, what I call it is a combination of Warsaw Ghetto and the concentration camp. Why? Why you call it a Warsaw Ghetto? Because in 1941, 1944, the Jewish community were digging tunnels in Warsaw, in Warsaw Ghetto. They were digging tunnels to feed their kids. Right now in Gaza, you cannot cannot even dig the tunnels to feed your kids. I spent five hours going all over Gaza to find diapers for my kids. Five hours, I couldn't find them. In Gaza, we are in the 21st century. So Gaza is under siege since the last, how many years? Since 2006, since February, uh, August 16, 2000. Six, they are under siege. They are under occupation or colonization. I don't call it occupation because occupation, someone come and go. But settler colonialism, someone come and he has no place to go. So there's a difference in terminology. When I speak, actually, I'm very clear about terminologies. Occupation or colonization. There is different. I don't call it occupation. It's like the French when they occupied or colonized uh, Algeria. They left but we are dealing with settler colonialism. And some people said, you are subhuman. You are cockroach, you are nothing. Every day, every day. 
And we are hearing, we are the indigenous people, we are hearing it every day. Not, they are not willing actually to mediate or negotiate that we as a human being, we can live together even. We are okay with allowing our oppressor to live with us. But our oppressor, because he has $4 billion every year from the United States, he has $660 million military aid. He said, you know, I mean, if I am in his shoes, I will stay like that. $4 billion, every Israeli uh, got $750 a day. Look it up. Every Israeli got $750 from the US taxpayers. Please look it up. Every Israeli. But numbers. So this is Gaza. I was looking actually about this uh, town that I cannot pronounce. Pronounce. I know it is indigenous land. Uh, but it is 2,000, according to uh, this uh, statistics in 2010, the population in your town is 2,000 people. Very exciting. You know in Gaza, in one mile, we have more than 7,000 people. Like imagine, we have four miles of all of this area, beautiful area, that I wish I came in the day. <laughs> imagine, Gaza is the most populated area in the world. Gaza is an open air prison. People are dying every day. My mom, she couldn't go to Egypt for medical treatment. She is dying in front of our eyes. We can't do anything. This is siege. Kids, we have women, 20, 2,000 women with breast cancer, they cannot go overseas for medical treatment, and no one is listening, no one is reading. Imagine if they are the Israeli. Oh, imagine if there are two, not 22,000. Imagine if there, why we have cognitive dissonance. In psychology, we call it cognitive dissonance. Why you have cognitive dissonance? Why it is okay, they are a human being like you, but imagine they are Israeli. And those are colonizers. This is history. We can't, I can't deny it. Imagine if those are Israeli. We have talking about kids. 320 kids, they need uh, fibrosis. I really cannot remember. Uh, Prosthetics. Yeah, yeah. Arms, legs, legs. Yes. 320 people. How many? In the dialysis units in Gaza, we have 45 dialysis uh, units, machines. They are not operating. Why? Because I will, I will tell you why. Can you go to the other side? So, so I will tell you why, why they are not leaving and why they are dying slowly. And Gaza is moving, actually, from a slow motion genocide into a fast motion genocide under 1948, Convention on the Definition of Genocide. It's not our definition. 1948, Convention on the Definition of Genocide. We, all of the international community are with us. We have 221 international laws with us, except the United States vetoes any, 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 uh, any law for Palestine. We don't know why until now. Why 221 international laws? I mean, it's too much, I mean, against Israel, from the international community. But there is veto powers, like the United States, okay, but veto. And they create xenophobia in the Middle East without no reason. And why people hate me? So, <laughs> so look, this is Gaza. Here is there are gun, gun boats. You, the people can't go for three nautical miles for fishing, so the fishing industry, is, there's, no, there's no fishing industry in Gaza because of the uh, gunboats here. Look, this is Gaza. If you look here, here is the buffer, buffer uh, they call it the buffer zone, which is three, uh, two miles actually, three kilometers, I think one mile and a half. So in these areas, people, even if you do nonviolent demonstration, you can't even from Gaza. People talk, why you guys, why you shouldn't use nonviolence? How can you do it geostrategically? How you do it politically? How can you do it? My master thesis was about strategi strategies of non, uh, super resistance, non-violence. How can they do it? it? They can't fight, they can't fly. They are frozen right now. So look, this is the tanks. Look here, the drones, all of the time. About this is peace, tiny piece of land. 
smallest, thinnest state. Like, I mean, you can't, uh, it is the size of Portland. Portland and Scarborough, actually, together. But you know, it's the size of Manhattan. It's the size of, if you've been in, Ma in Maryland, it's the size of Bethesda. If you've been in New Mexico, it is the size of Albuquerque, New Mexico. So this is the size, very small. Two, ta two, two million people are living there. So I, can you go, please? Thank you. So this is Gaza. I, w I won't mention about war because I, I'm going to go into details because I want to give some time for talking about refugees. Uh, you can go. Uh, this is like, this is, in 2009, my family house was destroyed. And my family has to be homeless for a crime they did not commit. A drone just oh, by mistake. It was in 2009, a drone hit my area. And 36 houses were partially destroyed. And one of them is my family house. So everyone, and if we want to talk about the housing, I can go on and on, but we have 13,000 uh, houses were completely destroyed, and uh, 13,000 houses were partially destroyed. I'm sorry about numbers, but I have to give proof by numbers you, so you can look it up. 13,000, and until now, since 2007, until now, the international community said we will give you $4 billion to reconstruct Gaza. Nothing came to Gaza, nothing. And this is from the first war in the last, from 2007 until now, there were three wars against Gaza. Three wars, like my child, my daughter, she is eight years old, she experienced three wars in Gaza, and I will go into psychology about ongoing trauma and PTSD. Okay. Uh, th this is like when they started the siege, they said it is like a diet. We won't kill the Palestinian, we put them on diet. Uh, they just, I mean, this is racist. I mean, well, I mean, you can't come with anything. I call it jungoistic. I love that English terminology is jungoistic. <laughs> so this is a Rafah crossing. As I mentioned, actually, maybe in the, the fourth or fifth slide, uh, there is like tanks from the land, there is gunboats from the sea, and there are drones and jet fighters and Black Hawk and B-51 uh, helicopters uh, from, uh, from the air. And also, people cannot leave Gaza. There are two major crossings, one between Gaza and Egypt, and one between Gaza and the West Bank. The one between Gaza and the West Bank is controlled by Israel. I have never been in my entire life in Jerusalem or the West Bank because I am from Gaza. Why? Because there is Israeli registry law. If you are from Gaza, you can go to the West Bank. If you are from the West Bank, you can go to Gaza Strip. Why? Because they are the colonizers, period. And this is racial segregation. And even in the West Bank, there are Jewish only lands. And we have thousands of thousands of Jewish activists in the United States. I mean, uh, my hats are off to them. I mean, I spoke with them, we spoke. They are so, uh, so strong. They see it. They have blood boiling because they hijack their own religion, the Zionist groups, as like ISIL. They hijack one, less than 1%. They are hijacking 1 billion Muslim in the world. So I call. Israel is ISIL. So, can you go? <coughs> yeah, women, I mean, if you can live there, the idea, there's no media coverage. Right now in Gaza, give me one American right now in Gaza. They can go to the West Bank. Why? I, uh, I know Mike, he was in Gaza like two years ago from the Friends Committee. Uh, leadership, and they can go because they have organization, the American Friends Service Committee. Give me right now one. One. There is no, why? Because there is no media coverage, because they come to us. I was running organization for uh, trauma healing and war zones for kids. And they come, actually they come as a peace activist. And we, yes, 
go ahead, yeah, we would love that, do that. But then they tend to be a social justice activist because they see it by their own eyes. This is very clear. I mean, it's very, I wish Israel is not that smart not to show it because they are, they want to show power. But people come from America, from Europe, they come for one day. I swear to God, one day they come and they change. One day. And they said, oh, why you guys, why you shouldn't? Uh, we are working in civil society. We speak, we have no political affiliation. We just speak it as it is. <laughs> so can you go ahead? This is me when I was trying to get out of Gaza for, uh, to, to work on my master's degree in the United States. I spent six months, even there are some <laughs> governmental officials, they were intervened from Seattle actually, to come and six months. Why, and I have my visa, I have, I have all of the documentation, I have the ticket, so there is no reason, six months. And then I have 30 minutes to leave without even kissing my kids, because I have 30 minutes, I have to go. So this is struggle, I will talk about refugees, about stuff like that. So electricity, we have two hours of electricity right now in Gaza, that's why kids are, uh, uh, are reading without on candles, and we have like more than 35 kids were uh, 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 passed away because uh, because they left like their candles, and there is no people forget like. Uh, yeah, can you move? I told you. Uh, yeah, no, go go ahead. Yeah, as I told you about the numbers, I bought all of the numbers for you. I was giving a lecture in Newport, New Hampshire but I did not change the PowerPoint because exactly the same uh, audience. So this is the number in Gaza. 50% of the beaches were found to be contaminated because Israel is drawing the sewage. And because there is no electricity, when there is no electricity, you can't, I mean, you, you can't generate, there is no electricity. So the sewage goes to the sea. So right now we have 35% in the last year that the beach are contaminated. It is the only place for joy and fun. Because it's a very small area. So people, 50% are contaminated. And no one actually, there's no funding for international organization even for that. It's 22% of Gaza population from food secu security. This is from the United Nations, not from me. Actually, the 72. 9% 9 under the poverty line, 60% is under the uh, underemployment rate, also from international organization. 700 children need a quick psychological intervention, PTSD, ongoing trauma, acute stress disorder, ADHD, and mental health disorders. This, uh, this is about the exit in the last year because Israel tried to, to push you, to shock you more and more. And people get actually more resilient, which is, they try in psychology to understand it, but <laughs> they have to go there and see. There is a book actually uh, for Viktor Frankl, The Search for Meaning, he was in the Holocaust camp and he wrote about uh, the search for meaning. And I can relate what people like get resilient, even they are under uh, immense pressure and under too much murder, because by the end of the day, the human part, body, soul, mind, and heart for people like when they are under immense trauma, they seek for a vision in life or a meaning. That's why people said, you know, we have to fight for our country. Whatever, even if we speak the word, just speak the truth. You don't do anything bad. Just speak the truth. You will find hearts that will hear you. Yeah, can you? Yeah, about, um, thank you for helping me to spell, uh, ah, yeah. Enzyme, <laughs> enzyme deficiencies, deficiencies, 240 babies with enzyme deficiencies, no therapeutic milk, they will suffer lifelong development, developmental problems. Uh, cystic fibrosis, is it right? How I, uh, yeah, as you know, I told you it was. I actually checked what Maria Wolfstar about how to pronounce it because I read it some fibrosis, right? So, so uh, these, uh, these are uh, these one of the examples 
of why people are suffering and do, no one is listening and they are dying slowly. And I just want you to imagine for one minute, if, it is, if, if we are doing this for Israel, what the international community will be, why? Why people don't listen to those people like who are suffering every day for a crime they did not commit? For a crime they did not commit just because they are Palestinians. Just they happen to be Palestinians. They have, we have Jewish community like in Palestine. They are against Zionism. Why they are against Zionism? They are against segregation. They are against, against murder. There is ag against the ideology that can give you the power to kill another one. I mean, this is, yeah, go. I talked about this, can you go ahead? I wanna give time, uh, uh, yeah, uh, can you go ahead? I will speak about trauma. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm sorry. This is uh, when you, you have to do, uh, to do <laughs> the bar book. Uh, I just wanna inform you that will be emotionally disturbing photos. If someone has PTSD or someone who doesn't like to see these photos, please, yeah, like, forgive me if you can go outside. If it is okay, I have to take your permission. There are some photos, okay? Go ahead, please. So those are the kids. In Gaza, we have 532 children were killed in the last war. Gaza is the nation of children. Gaza is the nation of children. We have 53% of the population in Gaza are children. So if you shoot, if you like uh, shell a house or a building, you know 10 people will be killed. There is no place for the Zionism, Zionists to argue even, when I speak actually. There is no way you kill kids and you know, you have jet fighters, you have GPS, you have everything. You know you kill kids, 532 in the last war, 300. 25th, 25, the previous war. And imagine every day, and the kids, the kids. I'm not talking even about the adults, about the orphans in Gaza. I'm not mentioning about the orphans. I don't want to give you a say, wow, about the orphans in Gaza. They live without their daddy, they live all of their lives. All of their lives, and they knew that. They knew that, they knew that, they actually, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, which I uh, put my hats off to them, like Geshon, uh, like uh, Gosh uh, Shalom, like uh, Beth Salem, Israeli Human Rights Organization. Every word that he mentioned here, it was also mentioned in the, in the, in the Israeli uh, Human Rights Organization. So we are not coming from the uh, mass bringing some ideas to influence people. These are facts. So those are kids. <laughs> Imagine if in a trauma, and I will speak about trauma, and then I will speak about refugees after this. A trauma. You know, in PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, I, and you know there's a camera, I don't think there is PTSD in Gaza. There is ongoing trauma. People live every day with it. If you call it post-traumatic stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder comes after six months of the traumatic event. People who has a car accident after two days, like has a sense of denial, guilt, what happened, why I did, why I didn't care. It happens in the human nature. But PTSD comes after six months. Acute stress disorder after comes after one month, two, three months. People have like, when they have major traumatic experience, major, they get PTSD. But with us in Gaza, we are dealing with ongoing complex trauma. That means there is no non-stop. Every day, the kid, when he goes to the street, the kid is innocent. I mean, the kid is innocent. I mean, they have no clue about religion, about God, about anything. They grow up. You took them to church or synagogue or a church, and then you just train them. This is a human nature. So 
every kid, every kid goes every day and they see destruction of houses. They said like one of their brothers or one, they were killed in the last war. One of their friends in the school, they were killed. The kids, sometimes they laugh, they laugh. But they knew deep inside there's something going on. Why, why us? I worked with kids for five years. I created a project, Let the Children Play and Heal. It was funded by the Middle East Children Alliance in Berkeley, California. This is a project. We are not about going into details because you know I am program manager. I like to go into details, but uh, but what we are doing, we were doing to help kids to discover trauma and refer them to psychiatric or uh, some psychological consultants. We found that kids in the drawing. I will show actually by, uh, at the end uh, how the kids when we do writing therapy for them, how they can draw what's in their minds. Kids are the most innocent people. And they cannot actually be challenged, especially in Gaza. One reason, one proof actually. Once there is an Israeli psychiatrist, he was in Israel Channel 2. He was speaking Hebrew. He said, I really want to understand why kids in Gaza, when we destroy a building, they go to see what's going on. They, I mean, we, want, we destroy that building, but uh, after the, we destroy it, we look from G, uh, uh, cameras and we see them because they grow up with this. They have never seen peace in their lives. It is a stupid to, to, to tell people about peace when you are raped every minute, when no one even hears you that you are raped. This is the high they're not, it happens to you. The high is continuous. This is ongoing trauma. This is ongoing. Every day, therefore, unemployment rate, 60%. Imagine a man, he cannot give his, uh, his son a shekel. Shekel is the Israeli coin, or let's say 50 cents in American currency. Every day. Why? And we have the highest rate of PhD candidates in the world. And look it up. Gaza has the highest PhD candidates because every family from their income, 80% goes to education. I have four brothers and four sisters. All of them are educated. My sister has a master's degree and I have a master's degree. And, and, and my brothers, everyone is educated especially women, for different reasons. Can you go ahead? So this is my friend in Gaza. <laughs> he asked me, because I speak everywhere, if you go anywhere, please tell them that I miss my daughter. I left her for, he is like some man, you know, breadwinner, goes to work and come home. <laughs> Nothing. He came and he saw. His daughter were killed. Look at her, how, how beautiful she is. I mean, a human being like him. I just, I told him, I'm not gonna speak anywhere in the world, anywhere. And to show the photo of your, uh, of your uh, daughter, because she deserved for people just to challenge their comfort zone. They just challenge it for one minute to seek humanity, at least to sleep tonight after this talk. Can you go ahead? So as I told you about the search of meaning, people, kids are looking for meaning in life. Why God us? Tell me why us God. Tell me like why I have to suffer for no electricity, no water. Major depression, clinical depression in Gaza. Clinical depression, we have the highest rate right now. Some people cannot. We are resilient people, but there are some people like, you know, I don't give a damn about it. You know, there are people like here. Good people and bad people, like everywhere. Some people can, afford, can, be, can tolerate it, some people cannot. So not, so, so kids, what's going on like every day? And they see in the news, one mortar from people like we are against any attacks because we are the oppressor, the oppressed. I mean, if you launch a mortar from Gaza to Israel, all of the New York Times, Washington Post, oh wow, one mortar. 
we are dealing with thousands who were killed and nothing. But I, I don't want to go to the influence of the Israeli lobby in the Congress and the Senate and also the Israeli lobby and even uh, everyone in it in Washington. Everyone in it, but they can't do anything about it. Go ahead. This is my wife when, when the war started, she has to be homeless with the kids because the area, our area was in the border area. So she went to the, and she took this photo. This is a newborn, this is child. For me, actually, this, this photo costs all of the world's money. Child just taking care of her, of a newborn. This is Palestine, this is love. This is where Jesus Christ was born. I, if he was here, he wouldn't allow this happen to his compatriots, at least to the Christian community who are suffering every day in Bethlehem because of Zionism. The last time they I took the Archbishop, uh, the Bishop Atalla Yohanna, because he speak, he speak Atalla Yohanna, and he he's Palestinian. He he speak about like killing people like uh, every day. All of the Christian groups. Some people said, "Oh, are there Christian in Palestine?" Don't give me a break. This is where Jesus Christ was born. <laughs> I know, literally, I was speaking in New Mexico. Someone said, Jesus Christ was born in a church, you know, in Santa Fe. The, where is the like, square? I was there. And someone said, like, you know, I went to a church. I love to go to churches, actually. Even I'm not religious, but I love to go to churches, especially Quaker, actually. Uh, I'm in a night. And someone said, like, uh, I told him, you know, I won't leave it. Please excuse me. Like, uh, it's really because I heard that he was born in Palestine. Yeah. He said, yeah, no, he was. I said, okay, okay, you know, I don't want to argue. Just leave me alone. Actually, this is the level of willful ignorance is too much. I mean, it is really too much. I mean, support Israel, okay, support colonialism, we are okay with that. We will have our own supporters. Because we touch heart, we speak to mind, we speak to bodies of people are dying every day, and we speak to their soul. If you can, if you have the moral power as us, please go ahead. They have no moral power, and this, they have the fourth military in the world, but they have zero, zero in the moral power, and that's why we are focusing. We have no guns, we have no tanks, but we have our voice to speak the truth. This is what we have. And we will liberate our Palestine by our voice and by our pens. We were right, because we are talking to minds, to human beings. We are not talking to, to something uh, different. Can you go ahead? Can go ahead? Yeah. So in the drawing therapy, when we give the children, I just want you to slide, uh, not now, and you see what the kids come up with. So I can have a drink with yours. See how, uh, how good I am? Just use it. Yeah. yeah, just show them and look at the, the missile. And actually they are smarter than, uh, than us because the missile is, you are giving, We finished final.
After we finished finalize our project with the kids, you know, we uh, actually uh, I wrote a new project, uh, let the children practice their rights because the kids usually, uh, some people normalize their own oppression by the day because it's it became a habit. So we would teach them about their own human rights, about the, that you have the right to play, you have to write to a safe place, but we are under colonization, and that's, you have to know that. So we, we teach them also, while they are going that, I'm sorry, be patient, uh, stuff like that. Uh, so I will talk about refugees right now. Can we uh, shut, because, uh, thank you. So uh, I, I'm working actually as director of programs at Maine Immigrants and Refugee Services. I run all of the programs, uh, beginning from behavioral health services, also mental health management, mental health case management with refugees. Uh, I want to speak about the Syrian refugees right now because it is, is like one of the most, uh, it has a lot of coverage in the news. So in Syria, for instance, after the, what happened in 2011 between the opposition party and between Bashar al-Assad, which is his Syrian, uh, Syrian um, the Syrian president, away from talking to politics was good or was bad, let's talk about refugees. Six million refugees have fled their own, uh, they fled Syria. 2.1 Syrians are in Turkey. 2.1 Syrians are in Turkey. 1.5 million are in Lebanon. Two 1.6 million are in Jordan, and Jordan is the size of Indiana. We have more than 60 million, 60 million refugees all over the world, all over the world. They are in the refugee camps. United States accepted less than 1% of the total refugees. United States used 99% of hate against refugees in the media. 90, like one, less than 1%. I mean, you can't even equate with Germany. You can't. Or go to Turkey. Or go. So, so I just want to emphasize, I know I'll allow a question so I can finish on time. It's very hard to be a refugee in the United States or asylum seekers. It's very hard to be a refugee in the United States. Why? People on the refugee camps spent 14 years to 22 years. I have a friend from Congo. I have clients also from different areas. I have a friend from Somalia, 14 years in refugee camp, 14 years in a tent, 14 years until they come here. And they did not choose actually. They come, the international community come, and they say, you, you guys, where are you gonna go? Oh, when I go to Germany, no. The US system, how it works. It's very important to know how, how it works. The international office, the OCHA, the, office, the United Nations uh, Refugee Organization, they said we have refugees here and they take care of their camps in the refugee camp. Right now in Zaatari, Zaatari camp is the biggest one in Jordan. They call it Zaatari camp. What happens, the International Office of Migration, what happens before the International Office of Migration, after the refugee become a refugee like he fled, they call it first asylum country. It means he left from one, his own country to a neighboring country. That's called first asylum country. First asylum country. There, he wait, can wait four years, five years, seven years, 15 years. He should be lucky. And most importantly, he can't go to other areas to, to work. And what we call it in refugee terminology is urban poverty. Like in Jordan, they are in Zaatari camp on the border. They can't go to Amman. If they want to go to Amman, they cannot work. That's why we call it urban poverty. They go to the urban areas and they become uh, uh, they're still poor, I mean, this is what they call it, urban poverty. After what happens, after like you are, you are okay, they ask refugee 
uh, program. It is a federal program. Come to go to uh, to go to to Zaatari or uh, anywhere. I'm just giving you an example about Zaatari camp. You will have the Department of Homeland Security. You have the intelligence officials. USCIS, US Committee for uh, US uh, uh, Custom and Immigration Services. They will go there and they will hold an interview with the refugee. How many interview? Different several interviews. And after the interview, it goes to ten national intelligence agencies in the United States. Ten. It goes to biometrics about fingerprinting now. Everything. They check everything. So people said, you know, I don't want to go. I mean so much, like 15 years, four years. And most of them they have they are they have family here, like one. I am a dad, I have one and uh, my kids or my family are there. So those are refugees. There are different kinds of uh, here in the United States. There are refugees, there are asylees. Asylees, the difference between asylum and refugee, some be, uh, just before I go, because there is a huge difference. Asylum who, are, who, have, who came, who secured to come into the United States, and they ask a permission or ask a protection from the United States based on a well-founded fear. A well-founded fear. It means well-founded fear comes into five accounts. Religious persecution, like if you are from Iraq and you have religious persecution because you are Christian or Muslim or whatever, you can seek asylum, but you have to have what they call it corroboration letters, evidentiary letters. You just can't come here and just, I will apply for asylum. It's not easy, actually, because the law is very, very strict. So I just, I want to make, I want you to, to know like how it is tough. It's not easy, actually. And the second one, Political orientation, you have, you are against a political party and they, uh, they will kill you or they will put an ambush to kill you. This is asylum or people come here. The third one is uh, sexual orientation. People, uh, they are gay or lesbian, whatever, they are overseas and they can, they come here, they can seek asylum. So this is the third. The fourth one is belonging to social grouping. Like, for instance, in Iraq, there are a lot of social groups. They said, like, Yazidi is just a group uh, different, like in the north of Iraq. And they may have some persecution from the Arab community or from the Muslim community for any reason, like, they can seek. I'm giving just one example, like. And the fifth one, I really forget it. <laughs> no, the fifth is also imputed political opinion. Imputed political opinion, that means that you you fear because of your writing, you came here and you started to write, you started to be free, and in your home country, people recognize you and there will be a danger if you go home. So this is different. A refugee come from a refugee camps. They apply from there. Asylum come here and they seek protection, which is, so what we do, we have usually people who come, as you know, uh, people come with a trauma. A a trauma can be lasting. And especially with people from Middle East and other areas because there is no, there is a stigma also related to, to therapy. Like in Palestine, we have no office of therapy. We have Gaza Mental Health Foundation. But the therapy office, like talk therapy, or you go just talk and we use a group therapy, which I think it is the best one, actually, in dealing with trauma. But people like with mental health disorders, like psychosis, like schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and all of these, uh, is very hard because there is a stigma. So people die <laughs> and they suffer every day. Uh, um, I think uh, I will... Uh, Go to the Q and A. Yeah. Thank you.